Now, after doing uh, the discussion of pneumonia, let's move on to the discussion of another important topic in pediatrics. This is like approach to a child with strider. Okay, a strider is a type of noisy breathing. It's a high pitch type of noisy breathing, which mainly comes from upper airway. So if a child comes to our hospital with a strider, then how to approach? What type of history we take? What type of causes we suspect? What investigation we do? And how do we manage? Okay, so let's talk about this topic. This is a bit of clinical topic once again. Now see here. Strider is a harsh noise produced by obstruction in the larynx and trachea. Larynx and trachea usually, or even you know, upper than that, uh, if uh, upper part of the larynx is affected, you know, uh, or lower part of the pharynx, then also uh, strider may be heard. But the most common, uh, you know, site are larynx and the trachea. Now, there are different types of strider, though the principal type is inspiratory, is expiratory, you know, strider also exists, or even biphasic strider may be there, means on both phases of the respiration, inspiration as well as expiration. Now, see there, inspiratory strider is mainly heard in a supraglottic type of obstruction. Glottis means vocal cord. Supraglottis means above the vocal cord. Whereas expiratory type of strider is heard in obstruction of distal trachea, lower part of the trachea. And biphasic type of strider is heard in glottic obstruction, means obstruction right in the larynx, subglottic, slightly below the vocal cord, but is still inside the larynx or proximal part of the trachea. So these are biphasic one. So inspiratory, expiratory, and biphasic strider. Now, let's uh, distinguish between supraglottic and tracheal obstruction. Uh, supraglottic, remember, gives rise to inspiratory type of uh, in strider, whereas tracheal obstruction, if it is a distal trachea, this is expiratory, and if it's proximal trachea, it is biphasic. So inspiratory strider is more common in supraglottic, and here is expiratory. Cry is muffled in glottic, the cry is weak and hoarse. Now, glottic means vocal cord, larynx, and from there, voice is produced. So if something, you know, some something wrong happens in our larynx, then the voice quality will change. This is known as hoarseness of the voice. And sometimes the voice will be very weak also. We cannot produce the voice. We have experienced that, you know. And in trachea, uh, voice is normal. Dyspnea is less severe in supraglottic type of obstruction, whereas dyspnea is more severe when you go distally. Cough is less marked in supraglottic, and in trachea, deep barking type of cough may be present. Now, there is one condition which we'll deal in today's class. This is known as Krupp syndrome. Krupp. Okay, Krupp syndrome. Now, Krupp syndrome means. This is a case of acute laryngotracheobronchitis. Acute laryngotracheobronchitis. Larynx, trachea, and bronchi all are inflamed there. So in that case, deep barking type of cough is highly typical. And this characteristics feature of the cough will make us you know, suspicious about that particular diagnosis and we'll do certain other investigation and confirm it. Let's move on. Now, how to evaluate uh, this type of child or how to approach this type of child? Now, these are the important point in the history. Ask about the age of the child first. Now, if your examiner asks you, what is the correlation of age with strider? The answer is, there are two main causes of strider in clinical practice. One is Krupp syndrome, and another is acute epiglottitis. Krupp and acute epiglottitis. Now, Krupp syndrome occurs in younger child, less than two years of age usually. And even, you know, if we go into the detail, uh, like 
around six month to one year childs are more commonly affected in group. Whereas in acute epiglottitis, usually they are more than two years of age or less than five years of age. So age group is important. We always ask this. I'm just explaining the importance of this here, okay? We always ask the age of the child. Ask about history of cough, cold, fever, and some other respiratory symptom. Now, cough, cold, and fever, if it is a mild grade, they are very, very suggestive of viral infection. If fever is high grade, it is suggestive of bacterial infection. Associated symptoms, ask about history of choking, history of aspiration, and history of foreign body ingestion. So choking, okay, what is choking? Yes, what do you mean by that? Anyone? Uh, like sir, choking, yeah, the choking yeah. is a blockage of that like, airway, sir. And like by sir, it can be by uh, some food or like sir, like anything we swallow in like sir, it obstruct our airway, mainly sir. Exactly, exactly. You're absolutely right. Choking is sudden blockage of the airway when we are eating something, okay? When we are eating something or when something suddenly enters into the airway, that is that leads to choking. Patient choke to be say patient is unable to breathe suddenly you know and during that time if it is a bigger patient like adult or bigger child they'll catch their neck they'll catch their neck that's quite typical of choking and their face usually turn into red they cough vigorously and if you do not you know manage it in time then they become blue very quickly that means sinuses and they may die also if the treatment is late aspiration is a similar type of things, especially, you know, if some food particle enter into the airway, it, it may be, you know, a food particle which is present in the mouth uh, as a result of vomiting, okay? Or it may be some reflux of the acid from the GI tract, something like that. And then foreign body ingestion, uh, which is very common in children, especially they put different type of substances in their mouth, remember? The, these kids are experimental. They try to experiment different type of things. Some round pellets are put in the mouth. Sometimes coins are put in the mouth. Okay, different things, and they may accidentally, you know, inhale it. Okay, accidentally inhale it or accidentally ingest it. Now ingestion, it will go towards the GI tract, esophagus, and you know, stomach or, or intestine. But inhalation is a big problem. It again leads to choking. One very important history I like to provide you here is, if the mother comes to us and explain, my child was playing with some objects and suddenly he started to cough. This is an absolutely important history regarding foreign body inhalation. Because the child was all right before that, remember? The child was playing with some object and suddenly started to cough and then difficulty to breathe. Some noisy breathing like that. This is a case of inhalation. Now, ask about past history of similar episode or from the birth. Past history of similar episode or from the birth. These are features of chronic type of disorders, chronic or some congenital disorders. Some of the congenital anomaly may occur in the airway, okay? And they can lead to repeated type of problem. Ask about the vaccination. One of the important vaccine here is HIV or hip vaccine. Now tell me, this vaccine is given for which bacteria? Hip vaccine. Hemophilus influenza. Hemophilus influenza. Yes, sir. Type B. Type B, sir. Excellent. Hemophilus influenza, type B. Absolutely. And... What is the time we give this vaccine? What is the time when we give this vaccine to the child? Anybody? It is? Sir, under six weeks. Yes, yes. Yes. Sir, may I, sir, uh, sir, uh, uh, sir, the first dose is given at the month of, uh, like, sir, when the baby is two months, and sir, the second dose when the baby is, like, four months. And sir, the third, uh, and, like, sir, the third dose, sir, like, sir, it depends upon the condition, and we can give it at the six month of age. He's right. 
he's right okay but i want to you know add a little bit more there now see this uh in the developing country like you know in south asia from where most of us belong we usually give uh, this uh, you know uh, uh, epi schedule of the vaccine in 6 week okay 10 week and 14 week 6 week 10 week and 14 week and these vaccines are dpt okay uh, hepatitis b dpt hepatitis b and hiv these are the vaccine which you routinely give during that time in the developed country okay in the european country or in the in the united states they uh, uh, give this vaccination at two month four uh, four month and six month okay two month four month and six month so there's a slight difference but whatever answer you give you know we accept that because you're right you are correct you are following the book here so these are the three doses which we give first dose second dose and the third dose and after that uh, you know a few years you can still uh, give the booster but these three doses would be enough now, let me clarify a little bit more here this hemophilus influenza is a very important pathogen in childhood age it can give give rise to many different infection so what are those infection caused by hemophilus influenza type b yes uh, uh, laryngotracheal bronchitis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sir, is it laryngeal bronchitis caused by parent influenza, sir? Yes, yes. We will we'll come to that. Okay. We will come to that. That is a major part of today's class. Now, listen here. This hemophilus influenza type B mainly causes pneumonia. Okay. One of the important causes of pneumonia in children. Second, meningitis. Now, let me write that because that may be an important question from you for a different uh, you know, types of exam here. First is pneumonia. Second, meningitis. Okay. Third is sepsis or septicemia. Very important causes of sepsis is hemophilus influenza type B. And the fourth, which is associated with our topic today, is epiglottitis, acute epiglottitis. Group syndrome is mainly caused by viruses like parainfluenza and other viruses, whereas epiglottitis, another important cause of uh, strider, is caused by hemophilus influenza type B. So remember, these are the important infections. Very favorite question of the examiner, any examiner, they want to ask you this question asks about epidemics of influenza or para-influenza in that region, okay, who knows, there is a sudden outbreak of viral infection, and that is influenza or para-influenza, which are associated with Krupp syndrome. Let's move on. Now, what are the causes of uh, Strider? Or you also can call it differential diagnosis. Now, common causes are Krupp syndrome, acute okay, laryngotracheobronchitis, acute epiglottitis, acute bacterial tracheitis, and foreign body obstruction. These are the common causes of strider in clinical practice. Among them, the top two are the most common, Krupp syndrome and acute epiglottitis. Okay. Now, apart from them, what else? see there some of the uncommon causes but nevertheless you know we we may come across these cases as well which are associated with strider are severe infectious mononucleosis now what is the causative agent of infectious mononucleosis exactly exactly ebv ebv or Epstein Barr virus is the causative agent here. Okay, it can occur in children. It is more common in the adolescent and adult, but it may occur, also occur in the children. Also known as Kissing's disease or glandular fever. Another uncommon cause is quinge. Okay, quinge, also known as peritonsillar abscess. 
Now, it starts with tonsillitis, acute bacterial tonsillitis. Then the condition is worsened and there is a collection of pus there. This is known as peritonsillar abscess. There is a huge swelling, okay, edema in that area, and it may just lead to a bit of obstruction there. Retropharyngeal abscess, a collection of pus on the back side of the throat is retropharyngeal abscess. Laryngeal burns may be caused by chemical or extensive skin burn. Okay. Chemical agent like alkali or acid or extensive burns itself. Remember, when somebody is trapped inside the fire, okay, all around there is fire and the person is trapped inside that, there's a hot flames, hot fumes, everything is there and the person is inhaling that hot air inside and that hot air is causing laryngeal burn. This is one of the very common mechanism. Tetany. Now, tetany is caused by what? What is the cause of tetany? Yes. Hypokinesemia. tetany. Hypokinesemia, sir. Yes. That titanus and this tetany is a different thing, okay? Please remember this. Titanus is caused by clostridium tetany. It's a different, uh, you know, type of disease. But tetany, if they ask, this is hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia. It is uh, caused by hypoparathyroidism most commonly. But whatever, uh, you know, causes are there which leads to hypocalcemia can lead to tetany. Tetany means muscle spasm. So even airway can become spastic here. Diphtheria. What is the causative agent? Sir, bacterium. 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 Very good. Corine bacterium diphtheria. Okay. Corine bacterium diphtheria is the causative agent. These days, luckily, we don't have many cases of diphtheria because of vaccine, because we have DPT vaccine, DPT, diphtheria, polyticious tetanus vaccine. But a few cases are still seen here and there. And this diphtheria can result in airway obstruction. Mechanical trauma to the upper airway. This is a trauma case. And secondary to mediastinal tumor, like lymphoma. Lymphoma can even compress the airway and can result in strider. So in comparison to those top four, you know, these are uncommon, but we may come across these cases as well. Now, how to do examination of the child who presents with strider? Remember, most of the time, the child are quite sick. So we start with vital sign first, okay? Vital sign and general appearance of the patient. Now vital sign, pulse, blood pressure, temperature, respiratory rate, and pulse oximetry. All are important here. But from the topic point of view, respiratory rate and pulse oximetry are more important than other, okay? Temperature is also important here because uh, you know, few of these are infectious diseases. So pulse oximetry is, is taken all the time to make sure whether the child is hypoxic or not. Cyanosis, dehydration, and neck nodes are examined. These are the parts of general physical examination. Cyanosis, so severe hypoxemia. Dehydration means the child is unable to drink and there is a lot of evaporation of the fluid. Neck node, will give you some suggestion of infection again. Presence of nasal flaring, presence of suprasternal and intercostal retraction, okay? usage of sternocleidomastoid and trapezius, these also, the child is breathing with difficulty. These are signs of respiratory distress. So we examine this all time in case of respiratory illness. Now let's come to the direct type of examination, throat, and pharynx exam is done, okay, with utmost care. Now, let me clarify this. This child, okay, especially in case of acute epiglottitis, this child is already very afraid. This child is agitated, okay? The child tries to avoid the doctors or the hospital. So do not forcefully examine this child. If this child is too much agitated, then the airway may get collapse. You cannot even do 
okay intubation in this child now if airway is collapsed we have to do intubation to save the life of the baby or the child remember intubation means putting a tube into the trachea and then through that tube we do ventilation but that cannot even be done so what should we do we should you know uh, gently examine the child gentle approach is necessary and then every instrument has to be there uh, in your reach if you need something for example if the child is collapsed you know quickly uh, you can do tracheostomy there so tracheostomy sheet has to be ready experienced person who can do intubation should be there and these are anesthesiologist they are the best person for intubation because they have done thousands of intubation before so they are the best person even very experienced pediatrician is a is a good person for the intubation but a young doctor we have just you know uh, started the duty is not not the ideal person to do intubation during the situation because he may fail many times and that is detrimental for the health of the patient direct laryngoscopic examination is also necessary now laryngoscope is the instrument okay by which we examine larynx there are two types of laryngoscope one is direct another is indirect now this is a direct laryngoscopy which is uh, used for intubation so with this we can even examine the larynx directly examine for the chest whether there are bilateral ear injury or not and whether there are added sound or not now added sound means crackles and wheezes okay, these are the two important one crackle and wheezes so you have to examine the chest because some of the disease may involve the chest at the same time what is the level of consciousness of the child this has to be examined first along with the vital sign if the child is in coma that means hypoxemia is already very severe one if the child is restless that means hypoxemia is mild okay so this is how you confirm it now what are the investigation a general investigation you like to do in a case of strider so we go for x ray of the neck and that x ray of the neck should be done in ap view and the lateral view it is done mainly to rule out foreign body obstruction and sometimes foreign body can be seen there now there are different types of foreign body some foreign body are metallic foreign body some foreign body are vegetative foreign body now the no need to ask this question of course metallic foreign body are easily seen on the x ray but sometimes even vegetative foreign body like a peanut okay peanut or any other seed you know they can be swallowed there or they can be aspirated that is a better term swallowed means it will go to the gi tract aspirated now if i see very carefully there is a slight density difference between this swallowed foreign body and you know wall of the airway because there is a you know a bit of edema going on around that foreign body okay though it cannot be seen very properly but i need to pay attention there that's my point chest x ray is routinely done blood cbc and culture and sensitivity of the blood is always done in this case especially in a case of acute epiglottitis this is a very very important investigation because that that hemophilus influenza type b can be isolated from the blood and throat swab is taken routinely and it is sent for gram stain okay and culture and sensitivity can usually organisms are grown now with this let's enter into the uh, important type and here i am going to talk about three important types of uh, or three important causes of strider they are croup syndrome acute epiglottitis and acute tracheitis now see there laryngotracheo bronchitis is also known as croup syndrome it is common in the age group of 1 to 5 year 
but peak is around two years. Okay, that means it is more common in uh, two year age group or less than two years. Most common cause of acute strider in pediatric age group is croup. So this is an important topic from the exam point of view now because of the single uh, epidemiological data. Look at the causative organisms here. All of these are viruses, para-influenza virus, respiratory syncytial virus, influenza virus, adeno and rhinovirus, even coronavirus you can add here. So these are the causative organisms of group syndrome. Among them, para-influenza virus is the commonest one. Now, what are the clinical features or what are the presentation in case of group syndrome? In the beginning, because this is a viral infection, the child is having chorizal symptom. Coriza means common cold. Features of common cold will be there. There may be sneezing, there may be runny nose, okay, moist eye, slight fever. These are the common symptoms. They last for one to two days. Then there is cough and hoarseness of the voice develop. Cough and hoarseness of the voice. Now, why hoarseness of the voice develops here? Why? Yes? Sir, because the larynx and, uh, and so basically the vocal cords are affected, sir. That's why. Because of the uh, laryngospasm obstruction. Exactly. Uh, because of the recurrent uh, laryngeal nerve uh, involvement. Now, now, listen here. This is a case of acute laryngotracheobronchitis. So see there, larynx is a part of the involvement here. So because of laryngitis, okay, because of the involvement of the vocal cord of the larynx, hoarseness of the voice develops. There are many other causes of hoarseness of the voice. One of them is laryngeal nerve uh, abnormality, definitely. I'm not denying that, but here, okay, don't think uh, about that. It is simple infection or inflammation which is occurring in the larynx. Barking cough is a very important clinical feature of group. This barking cough is coughing like a dog actually, or barking. That cough okay, almost sounds like dog is barking there, that type of you know, uh, symptom, very typical. And sometimes what happens, you are working in the emergency department or accident and emergency department of any hospital. And in the middle of the night or in the early morning, the parents are very agitated, you know. They come running to the emergency room with their baby and the baby is barking, okay, uh, like a dog. The baby is having that type of cough. And with that one symptom, you can think, yes, this baby is having croup. So this is very, very typical one. Strider starts at night worse and cry or when disturbed and strider is usually biphasic here because uh, you know uh, lower part of the trachea is also affected here so it is worse and cry if the baby is disturbed or if the baby is agitated if you try to separate the baby from the parents then strider can even be worse there is hypoxemia so there are features of external retraction and use of accessory muscle. The baby may be restless, baby is anxious, baby is breathing fast due to increasing hypoxemia. So definite hypoxia is there because of the obstruction of the airway. In serious cases, the baby may even be cyanosed. Remember, for the cyanosis, we need more than five gram per deciliter of deoxygenated hemoglobin, then only cyanosis will be there. As the obstruction worsen, breath sound may become inaudible, inaudible and strider apparently decreases. Now, this is a, not a good sign. This is a worst scenario. Don't, we, we should not be happy. Yes, I am not hearing strider anymore. So maybe the baby is getting better. It is the opposite thing actually here. See this. When the obstruction worsen, the airway are clamping down. So there is no movement of the air inside. That's why breath sounds become inaudible and strider also decreases in intensity. Pyrexia may be mild or absent in case of croup. 
because it's a viral infection. So these are the presentation. Now, how to, how to make the diagnosis? This is a clinical diagnosis, clinical. This type barking cough, all these typical clinical features suggest this is a, a Krupp syndrome. And if we take the X-ray in the lateral view of the neck, we can see a steeple sign, a steeple sign. This is subglottic narrowing. Okay. Glottis is a vocal cord. Just below the vocal cord at the region of cricoid cartilage, there is edema formation and that lead to narrowing of the airway. Okay. This is known as a steeple sign. Now look at this steeple sign here. Okay. Steeple sign. This is the area of the larynx. This, this. Look at the acute narrowness of the airway here, this area. So this is because of airway edema, because of Krupp syndrome. Now, how to manage, okay, how to manage this type of child? So first of all, the child is breathless or hypoxic. So give oxygen, okay, give oxygen and give oxygen in the humidified form. See this, humidified form, okay. This humidified oxygen is administered in the tent. Now you may be wondering why, why it should it is given in the tent form? Why not in the mask or why not in the nasal cannula form? Because we don't want to disturb the child. We don't want to make the child afraid or agitated. Tent means it is a bigger area for the child, you know. So uh, oxygen is uh, our oxygen concentration is maintained in the tent and child is not afraid because child did not notice any change in the environment there. But if, if we put a small pipe inside the nose of that child or a small tube, that will make the child very agitated and mask, the child will quickly remove it. Okay, so your purpose is not solved. Along with that, the environment or the room should be humidified. Avoid the dry air in that room. And this can be easily done by steam or warm mist okay, in the room. Now we can easily produce steam or mist in the room. Just boil some water there. Okay? Boil a kettle of water there. And those, that steam or vapor which is coming out from the kettle will make that environment moist. Now, whatever air the baby is taking there okay, is moist air it will not irritate the airway. If you are giving humidified oxygen, okay, you don't need to do this probably, but if time and again the oxygen is removed, if the baby is not that sick, then this is a, a good type of management. Admit the baby in the hospital if there is high fever or if there is toxemia or hypoxemia. Toxemia means toxic appearance. Baby looks sick, high grade fever and hypoxemia, definitely admission is done. Monitor the vital sign time and again. What is the heart rate? What is the respiratory rate? What is the severity of the strider? What are the degree of retraction of the chest? What is the color? Is the baby is getting sinus or not? And what is the level of consciousness? Time and again, we need to examine these things in the hospital. Avoid sedation, okay, sedation. Now, why sedation is avoided in this type of kid? Any idea? Due to aspiration, sir. Good. That is one point I agree. Another one? Anybody? Sir, already <clears throat> there is hypoxia. If we give uh, uh, um, sedation, there is a compromise in the respiratory system. Excellent. Very good. That's the point we want to hear. Now, remember this different type of sedative drug like phenobarbitone, benzodiazepine, all of them are respiratory depression type of drugs. So the baby is already having a difficulty to breathe. They're already having hypoxia. Don't give this type of drug and suppress the respiratory drive further. Okay, so these are not preferable drug here. But at the same time, this baby is very restless, especially in the mild type of hypoxia. Baby is restless. And restless baby are difficult to manage. So one type of sedation we can give that is chloral hydrate. 
this chloral hydrate, uh, we will not have that type of side effect. Epinephrine is very important drug here. Okay, epinephrine or adrenaline. And this is given via the nebulizer. Now, I'm sure you all know the meaning of nebulizer, right? What is nebulizer? Yes. What is this? Inhalers. Sir, it's a machine in which we like uh, we uh, a liquid form we use and it evaporate those liquid and uh, into uh, uh, for evaporation of the liquid and we. Uh, it is a it. Drug, the liquefied drug. It is a machine uh, through which we can uh, administer the drug in inhale form. Exactly. All of you are right. Exactly. Now remember, whenever a patient of bronchial asthma comes to our hospital we usually give the medicine in the nebulization form. That means the liquid form of the medicine is put into that small instrument or machine. Okay, We connect that machine to the electricity and then that liquid form of the medicine is converted into the steam or vapor form and it will very easily go into the airway and exerts its effect. This is called nebulization. This is nebulization. Okay. Now here, epinephrine is given by nebulizer root. That this epinephrine is a sympathomimetic drug. It leads to vasoconstriction. So whatever airway edema is there, you know, it will decrease that edema. And at the same time, it leads to bronchodilation as well. So epinephrine is an important drug here. A steroid, okay, can be tried. A steroids are also, you know, uh, immunosuppressive drug, anti-inflammatory drug. The role of anti-inflammation is important here. So they can also decrease the airway edema. So single dose of dexamethasone or budesonide uh, can be tried. Okay? They also can be nebulized here. So these are some of the important management. Now, another one is we give heliox to the child. Heliox is a, a mixture of 80% helium and 20% oxygen mixture. Now, this has got a decreased density. Okay, If we mix helium and oxygen, it will have a decreased density and it is easier to go inside. That is the only idea here. In case of some child, if they are very sick, we can even need intubation. Intubation can be done by nasotracheal way or orotracheal way, but nasotracheal is better because child cannot remove the tube easily or even tracheostomy can be done, okay? Microscopy cannot be done. For example, some of the inexperienced people are there, you know, our endoscope uh, intubation is failed, then we go for tracheostomy, tracheostomy. But this is also difficult in the inexperienced hand, tracheostomy, okay? So it is a day-to-day -day activity for the ENT surgeon, but for the other, uh, you know, doctors it may be challenging but uh, the doctor who are working in emergency department may be familiar about the procedure of tracheostomy what is tracheostomy by the way what is the meaning yes tracheostomy what do you mean by that sir we create an opening or a stroma type sir, uh, like sir, uh, like in the neck, in order to place a tube into a person with pipe. Like, sir, we produce some type of, uh, of an external opening, basically, sir. Okay. Any other other student, please? Somebody is trying to answer. Yes. Tracheostomy. The, the tube is inserted in the neck. Okay. Below the vocal cords. Fine. Yeah. So, that, the, both, both the of them. Yeah. Yes, not removal. It is not removal. Okay. Now see this. It is not ectomy. It's ostomy. That means you make an opening on the anterior wall of the trachea, on anterior wall of the trachea, and then you put a tube there. This is called tracheostomy. So making an incision or making an opening on the anterior wall of the trachea and putting a tube there. So that airway is secured. This is not a tracheostomy. So in uh, when you study ENT, you will you will learn about it how to do tracheostomy. Okay. Now let's move on. 
this is a case of uh, uh, viral infection. So antibiotics are not necessary until and unless we suspect epiglottitis or tracheitis, which are caused by bacteria. Okay, antibiotics are not necessary here. And if you have done intubation, extubation is possible usually by two to three days. You don't need prolonged type of intubation in this type of cases. Once the edema is, is subsiding and the child you know, is improving, then we can remove the tube. Let's move on. Now with this, let's uh, enter and talk about another very important part of this topic or cause of strider that is acute epiglottitis, acute epiglottitis. And hemophilus influenza type B is the most common organism which causes acute epiglottitis, but it may be caused by other bacteria as well, but this is the commonest one. Peak age for acute epiglottitis is two to three years. So it is more than two years. So slightly older children are affected than Krupp syndrome. Regarding the presentation, this is a bacterial infection. So there is high grade fever, okay? High temperature is there. And the baby looks toxic. Toxic means sick appearance. The face is totally red or congested with high grade fever, okay? That is called toxic appearance. This is acute illness. So the history is quite short, usually less than two days. There is acute onset of severe inspiratory strider, which is rapidly progressive. This strider is a high pitch sound. So parents can hear this, okay, comfortably. And they're very afraid that when the baby is breathing, you know, this particular sound is heard from the airway. And uh, in no time, the baby looks very sick. So they are quite agitated and afraid. So they quickly bring this, this type of baby to the hospital. During examination, the child appears anxious. The child is afraid. And the child is, okay, drooling the saliva. Now, this is such an important point in the diagnosis of epiglottitis, that is drooling of the saliva. The swallowing is very painful because epiglottis is acutely inflamed. Now, remember, Epiglottis is right there on the posterior surface of the tongue. And that epiglottis will be closing the airway when the child swallows. So there is an active movement of the epiglottis during the swallowing movement. But what is happening here? Epiglottis is swell, swollen. It is painful. So that swallowing of the saliva is very painful. So the child drools the saliva from the oral cavity. Very, very important feature. Muffled voice, okay, or child may not be able to produce the voice. There is no hoarseness of the voice here. Rather, the voice is muffled. The child doesn't want to speak. Or even if, if, if he tries or she tries, you know, uh, the voice production may be a bit difficulty here because of the inflammation in the surrounding area. Let's move on. Now, how to make a diagnosis? The diagnosis is mainly clinical. So what are those clinical points? Let me re repeat again. The age group is important. Okay, two to three year old child or less than five year old child. Uh, then they have high grade fever. They look acutely sick. The history is just two to three days and they are drooling the saliva. They're acutely breathless. All these things are important one. We take X-ray neck in the lateral view just to visualize the epiglottis here. And the epiglottis may be you know, seen as a thumb sign. Okay, later on, I'll talk about it. There's an X-ray also I have collected. It is known as thumb sign. And the lateral view of the X-ray, the swollen epiglottis is look or seen as thumb sign. Now, one very important practical point, please all of you uh, pay attention here. Doing X-ray at this phase may be quite hazardous for the child. I already told you the child is, you know, agitated means afraid. During the, this uh, episode of hypoxemia is making the child like that. Okay, and there is a severe type of inflammation going on there. Now, if we make this child further afraid, then the child 
airway will be completely collapsed and child may die. So do not send this child for X-ray, okay, only with the parents. That's what we do in the, in the hospital. This is the common thing what I'm talking about here. You have uh, maybe um, so many patients in the emergency room. You are taking care of those patients, you know, and you, you just thought X-ray is important here. So you, you feel the X-ray, you know, the slip and send the parents with the kid in the X-ray department. And inside the X-ray department, there are no doctors there. There are just the radiologists or some technicians, maybe the helper. They do not know how to resuscitate the child. And if something happens there, the child may die and you will be held responsible for all of this. Okay, later on, the question will come to you. Why did you send this sick child for the X-ray? You can even manage this child without X-ray. The point will come like that, okay? That's why it is written. It may be hazardous to do X-ray during emergency situation. Another important point here is direct laryngoscopy should be done under general anesthesia with intubation and tracheostomy set ready. I cannot do direct laryngoscopy, you know, just like that without giving anesthesia. I'll make that child, that child very afraid, agitated, and airway may get collapsed. So GA is given, okay, quick type of general anesthesia is given, like succinylcholine, okay, that's the muscle relaxant actually, along with that, maybe we can give ketamine, then a quick examination is done, and then confirm it. But during that time, make sure intubation set and tracheostomy set are ready. If they are necessary, you can quickly apply them. If they are not in your reach, you know, and when you need it, what you do? Hello, sister, can you bring the tracheostomy set? Can you bring me intubation set? That is too late. And they will go here and there and find them. That is not the way we work in the emergency room. Everything should be there on your reach. If it is necessary, it should be available. And this is, uh, you know, uh, this has to be done by the proper management. Now, when, when we are doing direct laryngoscopy, we see the epiglottis is very red, it is swollen, okay? And there is surrounding edema, and we call that angry epiglottis, okay? Angry epiglottis, this is a term given for the appearance, which is a diagnostic feature. Now, what is the management? How do we manage this type of child? We admit the child in the hospital because this is a very serious condition. You never discharge the child, okay? Always admission is done. And uh, the child usually require intubation to secure the airway, okay? More than 60% of the time intubation is necessary because the child already have sinusitis or severe hypoxemia. And intubation should be done by very experienced person. IV antibiotic is started immediately. Now, these are the choices of antibiotic here, third generation cephalosporin or chloramphenicol, any one of them. But uh, if you uh, ask me personally, I will always prefer third generation cephalosporin over chloramphenicol. Why I'm saying that? Why? So because chloramphenicol have a uh, severe side effects, it lead to the egg granulocytosis and uh, anemia, uh, red cell destruction. Exactly, you're absolutely right. The most dreaded side effect of chloramphenicol is bone marrow suppression, okay, leading to a granulocytosis. We don't want that to happen. It is one of the cause of aplastic anemia. Now, the chances are quite rare, but we always take, what if that happens to my patient? And if I have some better choices, why should I go for that, okay? So chloramphenicol is a reserve drug these days. We don't want to use it as a first line at all. Now, role of corticosteroid is not very clear because this is a bacterial infection. So a bit of controversy here. Uh, if we use corticosteroid, maybe the infection will be even more serious. But at the same time, if there is a severe edema on the surrounding area, you know, we can try a dose of corticosteroid. Once intubated, Tube should be kept for 12 to 24 hours to settle the inflammation. Then after that, the tube can be removed. That is called extubation.
Now, see here, this is called thumb sign. Okay, this this uh, swollen, you know, structure which is seen here. This is a lateral view of the neck, lateral X-ray of the neck. Uh, this is called thumb sign. This is the swollen epiglottis which is seen here. This is the hyoid bone, hyoid bone, and this is the epiglottis. This is the air which is present in the airway. Now, after going through this, let's differentiate between epiglottitis and croup. And if any question comes from this topic, this is the one, you know, because it covers both of the conditions, isn't it? So this type of questions are quite favorite in the examination. Now, regarding the organism, Haemophilus influenza type B is the organism for epiglottitis, whereas croup is mainly caused by para-influenza virus. One is viral infection, another is bacterial one. Regarding the age, the epiglottitis child are a little bit older than croup child. You see that? Generally, they are two to six years old. It may also occur in older children and even in the adult. Whereas croup syndrome, uh, the age group is less than two years usually. Okay, It may occur in child between six months to six years, but average is, is around two or less than two. Regarding the temperature, this is high grade because it's a bacterial infection. And in this case, it's a low grade. Dysphagia means difficulty in swallowing is severe in case of epiglottitis. There is drooling of the saliva because the child cannot even swallow, okay, his or her own saliva. Whereas in croup, dysphagia is absent. Important point. Dyspnea or difficulty to breathe is very severe in epiglottitis. And it is quite variable in croup, means some of the baby may have severe dyspnea, some other may be having very mild type of dyspnea, some others may not be dyspneic at all. So it is quite variable. Drooling is present, and it is not present in croup. Lymph nodes are present or palpable in epiglottitis because it's a bacterial infection, there is higher chance. In croup, it may not be palpable or just palpable or slightly enlarged. Cough, not very common in epiglottitis, whereas in croup, it is a diagnostic feature. There is a barking type of cough. Voice is muffled in epiglottitis and it is hoarse in, in croup. Okay, hoarse type of voice, the quality of voice changes. Regarding the posture or position of the child in the bed, the child is sitting forward in epiglottitis and in croup, the child lies down on the bed. The sitting forward is also known as tripod position. Tripod. The child is actually, you know, leaning forward and sometimes, you know, uh, supporting with both of the upper limb on the bed. This is known as tripod sign. It is also seen in emphysema in case of adult. Just to make, um, you know, easy to breathe, the child is attaining that position. Regarding the behavior of the child, it's quite terrified in case of epiglottitis. And in croup, the child struggle for air. X-ray, here it is thumb sign. And in croup, it's a stipple sign, you know. And some other you can add always. This is never the complete list. You can always add according to your convenience or if you think that is necessary. So uh, remember, these type of questions are quite important from the exam point of view. So please prepare well. Now, let's move further. Another uh, common cause of strider in pediatric age group is acute tracheitis. Now, this tracheitis is also known as pseudomembranous croup. Pseudomembranous croup. Okay, so there is a formation of pseudomembrane. Pseudomembrane is a not a true epithelial membrane. Rather, it is formed by the exudation, by the organization of exudate there. So it also affects trachea. That's why the term croup is there and the typical name is given. It is less common than laryngotracheobronchitis or croup and epiglottitis. It may follow viral upper respiratory tract infection in children, which is very, very common. URTI, absolutely common infection in children. And in the beginning, the child may be having URTI. After two to three days, the same child may be having tracheitis as a as a secondary infection. It is mostly caused by Staphylococcus aureus and occasionally by Haemophilus influenza. So these are the bacteria 
which often cause tracheitis. Now look at the uh, presentation of this child. There is moderate pyrexia for two to three days or the pyrexia or fever may be high grade also, you know, it depends on the bacteria. The child looks toxic or sick with brassy type of cough. This is brassy cough. This is one of the, you know, a type of cough which is explained in the literature, brassy cough. And the child is having inspiratory strider or biphasic strider as well. Purulent tracheal secretions are common. Okay. If, if we try to, you know, aspirate or, you know, uh, aspirate the airway, then the pus, the secretion which is mixed with pus would come out. And we can send that for gram stain and culture. The examination will show extensive tracheal inflammation and copious secretion with no gross epiglottic change on the laryngoscope. That's how we rule out. This is not a case of epiglottitis. Rather, it's a case of tracheitis. Now, how to make a diagnosis? The diagnosis is mostly clinical here. Clinical. All these clinical features, that brassy type of cough, uh, a relatively high-grade fever, sick-looking child, okay, uh, will we'll give you the diagnosis. And confirmation can be done by laryngoscope again, okay, along with that, uh, always make sure intubation and tracheostomy set are ready because all of these are similar type of condition. The, the airway may get collapsed because of too much agitation in the child. Regarding the management, virtually all children require intubation or tracheostomy. Okay? Rather than tracheostomy, intubation is important here. Because what is the use of tracheostomy if distal part of the trachea is involved, isn't it? There's no role of tracheostomy here. So intubation is, is the proper one. Frequent tracheal toileting is done. This is washing out of the trachea. So through the intubation tube, we can put some normal saline inside the trachea and suctioning it out again so that all that pus may be drained outside. Endotracheal tube to be kept for a longer period here because trachea is affected. It takes time to you know, settle down the infectional inflammation because Staph aureus is the uh, organism which is affected. So I will use this antibiotic. See that? They're anti-staphylococcal antibiotic. Can you name some others anti-staphylococcal antibiotic here? Yes? Anybody? Which are the other anti-staphylococcal antibiotic apart from flucloxacillin? Uh, sir, uh, uh, sir, we can give the cephalosporin like cephazoline, sir. We can also give nafcidine. Uh, we can also see, sir, give uh, sir, the vancomycin in case, sir. Televencin. Yes, you're right. So there are lots of anti-staphylococcal antibiotic in clinical practice, okay? Some of them are penicillin group, like cloxacillin, nafcillin, flucloxacillin, oxacillin, these are the one, okay? If they are resistant, uh, we can go for vancomycin. Methicillin resistant staph aureus is directly treated by vancomycin. At the same time, even third generation cephalosporin cover uh, staph, okay? But not, not the MRSA strain. I'm talking about other strain than MRSA. That is covered by third generation cephalosporin. Even clindamycin can cover uh, staph aureus. Even, even aminoglycoside can cover that, okay? So, these are the different antibiotic which will cover. But remember, uh, if it is MRSA, uh, you know, strain, then we have to go for vancomycin. There is no other way. Now, at the end, these are the key points or take home messages from this topic. This is an important clinical topic. So let us uh, repeat this. Okay. Now the concept is quite clear. Acute strider is life-threatening emergency. Never ignore it. Look at the causes of acute strider. Croup syndrome, acute epiglottitis, foreign body aspiration, trauma, and all those uh, a bit of rare type of causes. Fast clinical assessment and airway management is necessary. We quickly need to diagnose it, 
and uh, secure the airway because airway can be collapse any time. So airway management is paramount importance here. Don't leave the child unattended till airway is secure. After you put endo, after you put endotracheal tube, or after you have done tracheostomy, airway is safe, is secure. So there is no chance of collapse of the airway. Okay, but before that, don't leave the child unattended. This is very very important point. That's why I mentioned very clearly: do not send the child alone with the parents only to the X-ray room. Okay, if necessary, do the X-ray right there in emergency department. Call the X-ray person with portable X-ray. These are the different facilities in the hospital. Throat examination, laryngoscopic examination, and other type of examination should be done with intubation and tracheostomy set ready. Okay, if they are not ready, then during that examination, airway may get collapse and you will lose the child right in front of you and think about that feeling and how how did that happen because you were not ready with the instrument when the upper you know necessity is there you don't have uh, you know necessary instrument and that feeling is never good you cannot forgive yourself during that time so everything should be ready adrenaline nebulization injectable steroid and oxygen are the first step management, okay? Especially in the Krupp syndrome. Adrenal nebulization is very important drug there, okay? X-ray is not indicated until suspicion of foreign body aspiration. X-ray is not done until suspicion of foreign body aspiration because it may be hazardous. DPT and hip vaccines are important to decrease the cases of acute strider. Now, how? Can you give, give me reason? Uh, what is the role of DPT in decreasing the cases of acute strider? Yes? Uh, sir, because, uh, like, sir, like, sir, we read, sir, the diphtheria can also be basically, uh, like, affect the, uh, this answer. Uh, um, uh, sir, second, like, sir, the, uh, like, the hemophilus influence, sir, it the acute epiglottitis. So, sir, in, so, sir, in the both cases, like, sir, we can uh, give this vaccine and, like, sir, we can inhibit these, them, and, sir, we can, like, uh, save the patient from strider, basically. Absolutely, absolutely. That's what I want to hear. Very good. DPT, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, among them, diphtheria can cause strider because of the obstruction of the airway. Though these days it is a, a bit rare, but it has become rare because of this vaccine. So this vaccine is important, you know. So we routinely give this vaccine to all the kids at that particular age. Hemophilus influenza type B vaccine is also routinely given. These are given together. And this is for hemophilus influenza type B. So all of these are important point regarding uh, you know, the topic.